So um, it's worth mentioning that this is me you're talking to. And I haven't met a programming language that I don't spend forever complaining about. Um, <laughs> Greg's heard my Java rant many times. Um, so I'm here telling you about a programming language, so I figure by the I hate everything, it must be reasonably decent. And I'm not going to say that it's wonderful and perfect, but it doesn't suck in ways that drive me crazy, which is about as complimentary as I'm going to get. So um, first, I'm going to go back and talk about the G-Object system on which Vala is um, based, then go through Vala syntax and features. And then the thing that makes Vala worth it to me, which is its ability to bind to existing C code, and then some of its um, deficiencies. So the G-Object system is a um, object-oriented program convention for C. And um, that's weird, given C isn't object-oriented. That's why it is a convention. It is um, just regular C code, and you follow certain coding conventions about how functions and structures and whatever are to be named. And then by the magic of these libraries, which provide a shit ton of macros, you get object <coughs> inheritance, interfaces, generics, properties, and signals, which are callbacks or notifiers or listeners, depending on your um, language of choice. And it also gives you a huge set of utility functions called the glib, um, which it really is kind of what the C standard library should be of you get a string builder and you know the stuff that you always go, why don't I have a decent hash table in C? Um, I don't want to have to write one from scratch. And what's really interesting is this whole system was actually built around the GIMP, um, the GNU image manipulation program, and basically spawned the GNOME desktop. So the GNOME desktop um, with its supporting libraries being GTK for all of the graphics layout, um, Dbus for interprocess communication, there's an SVG render, or a multimedia streaming layer, there's Cairo and Pango and ATK, which is this whole layout monstrosity um, to do text and graphics layout. And that's used in all of the GNOME desktop software. It's the basis for the Firefox interface, used in the GIMP, used in Chrome and Chromium used in the BitTorrent application transmission. It really is everywhere. Um, so you have a lot of background code to use. Um, the problem with writing with G-Objects is there is a lot of convention you have to follow. You have to name things. You know, you put one underscore in the wrong place, and it will fail horribly. Um, you have to write a lot of boilerplate to marry all of the stuff together so that it knows that you have all of these methods, and it can find them, and it can do the appropriate inheritance, and um, it's, it's not trivial. And you have this collection of macros that are supposed to make sure that you do things like cast properly. Since the C compiler can't actually check that you're casting properly, the macro does it at runtime, which works. Um, but you're sort of trading off um, the, the performance that you'd like to have in the compiler. The other problem with the whole G-Object framework is you type G a hell of a lot. Um, you don't use ints and character and chars anymore. You use g ints and g chars because then it makes certain guarantees about the sizes they'll be on various platforms and like stuff like that. So yeah, you type. I don't know. I, I want to see the GNOME desktop programs because I'm sure the G is all worn through on their keyboards. Um, so what Vala does is it's a C sharp language, but it's built on using G objects. So basically, you're going to write something that looks like C Sharp or Java code, and it's going to spit out all of the glib boilerplate or gobject boilerplate to make all of this happen in C. And it's going to do all of the type safety checking that the compiler should be doing in the first place. And you get to interface with all of the gobject libraries because they have such strict coding conventions. There are actually Vala tools that can scan through the header files and provide you with a nice interface um, automatically from the C code. Um, and it's generating C code. So when you invoke the Vala compiler, you can actually have it just compile directly, or it can emit the C code, and then you can link that with other C code. And it's C, so anything you can do in C, you can do with this. It's easy for C code to call this code. It's easy for this code to call C code. 
Um, there's no, I mean, if you put public in front of a function, you can call it from C, and there's no weirdness, there's no, you know, spending forever figuring out strange calling conventions. You look at the header file and you go, oh yeah, this is exactly what I would expect the function definition to be. So if you've got existing C code, it's very nice. You're also not introducing new runtime dependencies because it's just generating C code. You do have the glib, which you probably already have if you're on a standard Linux type system. Um, if you really want, uh, uh, Vala will generate POSIX only code, so you don't even need the glib, but you lose certain features um, like inheritance if you do that. So here's hello world in Vala, because we're always going to do hello world first. Um, so up at the top, um, there's using glib, which is our sort of import equivalent. Um, we have main, um, uh, int main, string. You'll notice that instead of the usual C, arg, arg C with the arg count and arg V with the arg values, I just get one array. Um, I'll show you how that works in a minute. Um, I can use, I can do a printf to, stat, to standard output. I can use my regular C um, format conventions. And um, so here I'm going to check if I've got multiple arguments, then I'll print out um, one of them as my fill-in. If not, I'll just put world, and then I'll return one. And what you'll notice um, is that uh, I have percent %s here. Vala will actually do the type checking to make sure that this is indeed a string. Um, GCC will give you a warning if you don't match those up. Vala will give you an error. Um, also, one of the extremely handy ones is if you put percent %c to display a character in C, what do you have to do when you print f it? If you say put the C in the list of arguments, that is wrong. Because on some platforms, that will cause the stack to become unaligned, and you will get a bus error, because you will now split everything else on the stack. You always have to cast a char to an int when you call printf. I don't know how many times I've made that bug. Um, guess what Vala does? It casts it for you. Um, so nice conventions like that. Anyway. Um, this is the generated C. And the Vala compiler is not exactly pretty when it comes to generated C. It likes creating a ton of temp variables. So yeah, ignore the fact that there are 50 million temp variables. But OK, it's including the glib stuff that needs includes standard IO and string to be able to manipulate them. It has created this Vala main, which is the main defined in the Vala code. Um, it looks just like the regular main, except that it has the args first and the length after. The main function here um, has it in normal order. It initializes the gtype system so that um, the, that's sort of a standard practice for using glib code. You have to initialize the gtype system. And then it calls main with the arguments in the reverse order. Um, once in here, OK, it creates a shitload of temp variables. Um, you'll notice there's things like temp1, which is an array, and then there's temp1 underscore length1, which is the length of that array. So Vala will always try to keep track of array lengths for you, which is why I could go args.length in the Vala code. But it's actually passing them the way a C programmer would pass them. Yeah? It's actually, I've had to debug it, and it, it's easier to debug than you might think. Um, Yes. Um, so when GDB generates the code, when if you compile with debug symbols, the GDB generated code will refer to the original Vala file. So if you just look at your GDB output, you'll see in Vala code. If you've gotten to some really you know weird thing, then you may have to look at the underlying C to figure out what's going on. And obviously, the variables that GDB has available for debugging purposes are the Vala or the C variables, not the Vala variables. But in many cases, like my output, I called result. So that I'll still be able to access in GDB. So it's a little awkward with GDB, but I suspect GDB support is going to come along. And I. That it still looks somewhat scary, but I have done it, and I haven't wanted to cry that badly. It's been, there's been a lot of print, OK, it's in temp one, print temp one. That variable has been optimized out. Thank <laughs> you.
But other than that variable has been optimized out, I haven't wanted to hurt myself too badly. Um, OK, so it's done my little if statement here. Um, it goes along. If not, it assigns. Um, so basically, what's going to be temp0 is the thing it's actually trying to fill with my um, ternary if in the Vala code. So it either you know, pulls it out of my args or fills it with world. Then it comes along, and it calls fprintf on temp4, which is stood out. And then um, with temp5, which is the same thing as temp0, um, <laughs> which is either my th the thing it's supposed to fill in. So it's it's doing you know the right thing. No, the C compiler is going to strip this out. Because the C compiler converts everything to a uh, single, single static assignment, and then the optimizer goes nuts. So none of this copying things around a million times matters at all. Um, yeah, you're, don't worry about that. Um, OK, so what can Vala actually do um, in terms of the features of the language? So we have the usual you know, if, for, when kind of, or while operators. Um, you've got namespaces, which is very nice in the C world where don't have namespaces. Um, you have visibility modifiers. So Vala supports a public, internal, protected, and private. There is a limited type inference like C sharp has, which basically means when you initialize a variable, you don't have to specify the type. It just figures out the type from the assignment. Um, it has exceptions. They are not class-based exceptions. This is, again, a weird convention from the glib. I'll go into more depth. But you have exceptions. They're weird. Um, there are generics. Um, uh, there are properties, which are roughly equivalent to Java's get set methodology. Um, there are variadic arguments. So, you know, the printf dot 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 dot, and then I can have a list of arguments. There are delegates, which are function pointers or closures, depending on how you use them. Um, there are signals, which are equivalent to notifiers or listeners, so that you can basically say, some event happened, tell all of the interested parties that it has. It has memory management. And this is not the same thing as garbage collection. It will not collect garbage. It does not introduce that. What it is capable of doing is figuring out when things go out of scope and appropriately um, calling destructors. Something like the way that C++ will call destructors on objects if you allocate them on the stack. But Vala's is much more flexible, and you can apply it to existing C code, which is the really nice part. Um, also, uh, when it comes to objects, all types in Vala are non-null, unless you put a question mark after them. So if you get a string, you it is not a null string, and it will check for you. And it will make the check that you're not doing that inappropriately. In the C to Vala interface, if things are a little screwed up there, you can break those rules. But by and large, um, it works. So OK, into our statements and expressions, there's if, for, and while, pretty much exactly like you'd expect them in every C-derived language on the planet. There's a switch statement, which can switch on strings. Switch on strings. Um, and you cannot fall through. So if you, you can have case one, case two, case three, then a block of code. If you don't put a break statement, that's a compile error before your next case. Um, sadly, I wanted to do that once. <laughs> but Vala told me I was doing a bad thing. Um, so there are try, catch, and throw. Oh, sorry, there's for each statement. So you can iterate over arrays or classes that have iterators. And you can write, because of the way Vala's iterators are, they don't actually have to inherit to work. So you can take pretty much any object and add an iterator to it, even if it's a C object that doesn't really know anything about iterators. Um, there's try, catch, and throw, which work like try, catch, and throw. You would think they would work, but again, the exceptions aren't class-based, which is a little weird. Um, you've got namespaces and using to import namespaces. Um, like C sharp, you have you can specify whether a parameter is an in, out, or ref parameter. So basically, in um, in that sense, normally if you pass a parameter, it's assumed that the function can read that parameter but not change it. If it's a ref parameter, then it can read it and change it. If it's an out parameter, that it can only set it. 
so it doesn't have to be initialized before going in. Um, so again, in the C convention of this is a pointer to the thing where I want you to put the result, those are out parameters. And Vela offers you some protection on the way that you do that. Yep. In, in, is, in is assumed. It's only the others you have to specify. And you have to specify um, out and ref when you use it and when you declare it. So if in the function prototype it's ref, when I actually call it, I have to say ref the value I want to give so that you don't accidentally refify something that you didn't think was refified. Um, there's a null coalescence operator, so you know if this is null, fill in another value. There's an is operator to determine inheritance. Casting is a little strange. When you cast objects, like class objects, it behaves like C sharp. It's going to do an inheritance check and a type check and make sure that you're doing the reasonable thing. When you cast other things, particularly structs and what Vala calls compact classes, I'll show you about those later, it just does what C does, which is you the boss. <laughs> I assume you know what you're doing. So there are a variety of types in Vala. Um, structs, simple structs, classes, and compact classes. Um, there are also enums, pointers, arrays, and delegates. Let's deal with the major meat, which are structs, classes. Um, so a struct, Vala has no primitives. A primitive is a simple struct. So everything, everything that's a reasonable data type is basically either a struct or a class. So um, in the, these are sort of the different ways you'd think about using these things and the differences between them. So a struct, again, think of like a C struct. So how are you going to pass a struct? You pass it by reference. I have to give you a pointer to my struct so you can operate on it. OK, where are you allocating the struct? Probably on the stack. I mean, I just go you know, struct foo, and I've allocated memory on the stack for it. I haven't actually done the allocation. OK, how do you clean up a struct? Well, I allocate it on the stack. I know when it goes out of scope, it must be my job to clean up any memory I've allocated inside the struct. Um, Val allows you to add methods to a struct. I'll get into those. All of the members of a struct, though, must be public. You can't have a private member in a struct. Um, you cannot have properties in a struct. So an example would be time spec, which allows you to store a time. And the underlying C type for that would be um, a time spec in C, same thing. Um, simple structs are basically values. So an int is a simple struct in Vala terms. So the allocation similarly is on the stack, but simple structs aren't owned at all. They're just values. So there's no freeing necessary. Um, you can add methods to a simple struct. So yes, you can add methods to int, like toString. Um, you can um, have members, but they can only be static members. So int.max, um, it's not actually an instance parameter. Um, obviously, no properties if you can't even have members. An example would be what Vala calls bool, which is under, underneath a uh, gboolean, which is basically an int that's assumed to be 0 or 1. Um, on the class side of thing, classes are passed by reference. I always give you a pointer. You, cannot get anything but a pointer to a class. Um, the allocation is somewhere in the heap. I went and I malloced a chunk of memory, and now we're passing around the pointer to that memory. When it comes to freeing, classes all have a reference counter. Um, every time something takes ownership of a class, it increments the reference counter. When it's done, it decrements the reference counter. Once the reference count goes to 0, the thing is freed. Um, it supports methods, including virtual methods which none of the other types do. Um, you can have any kind of members, public members, static members. You can also have properties. Um, an example would be a GTK button, which the underlying C code would be GTK button. It's assumed that these classes are written in the glib style. There are also compact classes, which are classes not written in the glib style. Um, so Yes, someone has allocated memory, you're going to pass around that memory. So they're still in the heap. They, you're still always dealing with a pointer to it. But the concept that Vala has for memory management is ownership. 
So exactly one pointer in the entire program owns that structure. When that pointer goes out of scope, it must be freed. There can be other unowned pointers that point to that structure so that you can access it, but they don't matter in terms of memory management. Um, they can have uh, public members, they can have properties, and one of the sort of ones that you deal with regularly is the file stream. Um, that is Vala's version of a file I.O. and underneath it is a C file star. And when you think about a C file star, it kind of is like a class, right? You do F open to get a file star, then you have a bunch of things you can do to an instance of a file star, like f printf, f gets, f put c, c, you know. And then when you're done, you have to free it using f close. Vala is going to handle that much more nicely than we will. I'll get into the details. Um, as for the other types, there are nums, which work pretty much like you would expect the nums to work. Um, there are pointers. So if you want to take advantage of refs and stuff like that, you can. If you just rather say, eh, give me a pointer and I'll do it myself, you can do that. There are arrays, which pretty much work like C arrays. Vala has a length associated with each array. It can do one of three things when it comes to length. It can either say, I know the length, it's seven. Um, I don't know the length, but I know the array is null terminated. I'll just run through the array for you and count all the items and then make use of that. Or it can be, I have no idea how long this array is, good luck, which is sort of the C approach to arrays. Um, there are also delegates, which uh, again work something like function pointers, but can also be closures. Um, so objects in Vala don't necessarily inherit from the master object like they do in Java or C sharp, but if you inherit from glib.object, you get a bunch of advantages, so you probably want to do that for new stuff that you're writing. Um, instant methods, um, if you want them to be overridable, they must be marked virtual or abstract. You can't arbitrarily override methods unless um, you explicitly say that. This is very similar to C-sharp in this respect. When you actually override the method, you have to say, I am overriding a method by putting override in the declaration. Um, Super, construct or super class constructors are not called automatically. So again, in Java, there has if you don't do anything, then it will automatically call the base class's default constructor. If it has one, if not, it winds. Valley, you can do whatever the heck you like. Um, the default visibility for things is private. Again, Java and C Sharp, the default visibility is usually package level, where whatever's in the same file or package is allowed to see it. Um, for that, Vala uses the scope internal. Um, obviously, you can do child scoping with protected or completely visible with public. Um, C Sharp allowed you to define indexers, so you can um, do, if you have something like a map, you want to be able to address it like an array with square brackets, even if it were, say, a map from, you know, if I had a, a thing that's going to give me, I, tell you what string I want, and then it, you give me the string, the you know, key I, I want and the value associated with it, and they're both strings. C Sharp would allow you to define an operator of the brackets to do that, um, so that you could say, you know, my whatever, and then in brackets, foo, and it would give you back the result. Vala supports this, but um, you just define a method called get and a method called set whatever arguments they take become the arguments to the square brackets. So if you want to create some kind of multidimensional thing with you know, an int and a string as your parameters, you can do that, that's no problem. Um, the only caveat with that that I will say is that in C Sharp, you can create as many of those as, as you want. In Vala, you just get one. Vala does not, because of C, allow you to have overloaded methods. So once you define a method, you cannot change the type signature, and you cannot define another method with a different type signature in the same name. Um, there wouldn't be a sensible way to do that in C, so you're stuck with one name. Um, there's also properties, which again work like getters and setters. Again, this is borrowed pretty much directly from C Sharp, and you can actually specify get, set, and construct, and you can specify different privileges on them. So you can make a property which is public to get, but private to set or protected to set or there is no set 
but when you construct it, you can um, modify it. So then you create a property that you can only change once um, rather than using a public field. So it allows you to make a semi-public field, um, which is nicer syntax than the usual Java. Get foo, open bracket, close bracket. Uh, you also have C sharp or C++ style destructors. Um, if you don't write a destructor, even if you do, all of the fields are freed automatically, so you don't necessarily have to worry um, if you just do the obvious thing. And that applies for both structs and classes. Um, so enums and structs, enums and structs are not class-based. They are underlying C structures. So an enum is basically an int with pretty names. Um, but they can get instance and static methods, which is nice. So you can have an enum and give it a two-string method. Um, for convenience, or you can create a static method that's parse a string and return the appropriate um, enum. Um, structs can also have destructors, which clean up the contents of the struct. Um, enums may be tested for quality using equal equals because they're, point they're just integers. Um, and you can extract the names that you give in structs, or as they're given enums, using this weird glib reflection magic that's like this line of stuff that I barely understand, but if I just paste it in and change the right names, it works. Um, structs can also inherit from other structs, but inheritance with structs is a really, really weird thing and probably not what you want to do um, and may or may not make sense. I say don't. <laughs> um, Okay, delegates and closures. So delegates define um, function pointers and closures. The name is borrowed from um, C sharp. Um, so if you think of a C function pointer, it's here's the address of a function that allows you to do something. Um, that is a problem in many cases where you need to you need to pass some state along with it. So that is a closure where I give you both the pointer of the function and some supplementary information. That is how Vala will do a delegate by default. Um, so it will give you a um, the function pointer and a void pointer to some kind of structure containing all of the variables that it needed hoisted into that structure. If you request, you can have a de delegate that is targetless. That is, there isn't this collection of uh, relevant information. And that works just like a C function pointer. So if you want, so say we had a function like for each, which is going to go through our object foo and call whatever function pointer you give it a bunch of times. Um, we can give it an instance method like bar.quox assuming the function pointer, assuming the signatures match, and it will call bar.quox with all of the things that foo wants to, to call. I can also do something like the second one where I can create a little lambda expression um, that will take a string x and it will do uh, stdr.printf that x to, to the console. So again, you're saying, what would be the underlying C? It's going to define a function called underscore underscore lambda zero temp blah 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 that takes a stringed x and a void pointer, it's going to assume that in that void pointer, um, it's going to fill that in with the code to write, you know, f printf to std error with x. Um, in this case, the void pointer will be null because it doesn't actually need to keep track of anything. But in the case of this one, it's that void pointer is going to point to bar so that it has information, it has all that information um, necessary. Uh, you can also omit the type, and it will do the type inference if you want. So you can just say x, and it will go ahead and figure it out for you. So again, that's the C code you would write if you wanted to have a lambda, but it's done it for you. Yeah? Yeah. Right. Um, I'll actually show you the, the C equivalent code for this later on. Um, OK, there are also generics. Um, generics work by type erasure, which is like Java, um, but there is some extra information since there is no um, uh, memory management. So basically, when you call something with a generic, it doesn't actually know anything. It basically says, OK, you're giving me a void pointer, and 
if I wish to duplicate that void pointer, you give me a function to do that. And if I wish to free one of those void pointers, you give me a function to do that. And that, that's all I care about. Um, and Vala handles the magic underneath. And again, this is glib convention. So it doesn't do covariance and contravariance right. So if you create a subclass and start working with subclasses of things, it's doing really dumb things, but it can't do anything else given C is involved. Um, it's actually pretty close to what Java is doing because Java doesn't quite do it right. Um, now, the um, one caveat is this is it works pretty well in most situations, but if you have a generic data structure, um, you probably don't want to use compact classes and structs because it doesn't know how to duplicate them and they're not allocated in the right place in memory, so you can get weirdness if you do that. So avoid mixing generics and compact classes and structs. Um, and if you use a simple type, it will be cast to an int32. So if you've got an int64, yeah, you can't do that as a generic. Um, but if you put a question mark after it, it will wrap it in an object, and then everything will be happy. Um, so, and you don't get an error with that one. Um, they give you, uh, there's a library called G. Um, yes, yes, they've taken G to a whole new level of punniness um, that gives you the usual set. The, the data structures, you always go, damn, I wish I had a in C. Um, and you can use it from pure C if you'd like. Um, anywho, exceptions. Um, not class-based, so there's no inheritance. They're all error domains. Um, so this would be one error domain. I've decided to call it badness. And the two different exception states I can refer to are foo and bar. Um, so if I want to throw an exception, I just go throw new badness foo and whatever message I want. And you're very limited to this syntax. You can't pass along other information. You're stuck with this style of, of exception. Um, and um, if unlike C Sharp and Java's runtime exceptions, you can't just throw an exception. You have to explicitly say, I throw exception, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, otherwise, there's no way for the compiler to write the appropriate C. Um, you can check in your catch block what type of exception it is using is, and there's always a message member to the message that you put in. So it's not an ideal system, but it sort of captures 80% of the things you would probably do with an exception, and when you want to do some really weird stuff, you're screwed. Um, you can also do variadic arguments, so the dot, 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 dot. These are like Cs. So in C Sharp or Java, when you use variadic arguments, it takes the list of arguments, puts them into an array for you, and you have a nice day. C puts them in memory somewhere and gives you a pointer to the top of them and says, good luck. Um, that's what happens here. So you get access to them to by using VA list, just like you would in C. You get this VA, well, you can call it whatever you like, um, this object that contains all of your arguments. Every time you call arg with the appropriate type, it will remove one of those from the argument list, give you a pointer, and shuffle along to the next one. You need to know how many arguments you have. Yep. No. So, so it, you just get a pointer to the beginning of the string. Um, ju again, just like C. So this is, this actually literally translates to VA underscore arg. You can look at the man page where you basically give it the type you want, and it shuffles that pointer along by that many bytes. It's really ugly. Um, so when I call foo down here, um, I tell it three, because I've got three of these key value pairs I want it to process. And I give it the keys and values. If I gave it an int here, I'm basically casting an, casting a, the memory that contains an int to a double, and bad shit is going to happen, because this is C. So this is one of those, this is C. Um, but you know, by and large, it doesn't hurt too much. And again, if you've got a printf-like or scanf-like statement, it will do the type check for you. Just say, this is printf-like, and it will make sure that you know, percent %d is actually an int, and it all matches up nicely. Um, OK, signals are glibs uh, callback or notifiers in C Sharp or listeners in Java. So you specify it something like, inside your class, you specify it something like 
you would specify a property and um, then you just get to call it like a member function. So I just go foo.bluemoon42 and it will call all of the people attached to this listener that this event has happened. Um, the signals, can you can connect to a signal by just going the name of the signal, connect, and then the function you want called. You can be disconnected, but you actually need to have a pointer to the, like I need to have a real function, not uh, a lambda expression. And all of the glib object derived classes have a property notifier. So all of the properties you've defined, you can find out whether that property changes. Whenever that property changes, you can have a function fire off um, if you're interested, which is convenient. This mostly comes from the GUI handling in GTK. This is the bread and butter that makes GTK work. So you can basically say, OK, there's a button clicked event connect me to that. And then whenever the button gets clicked, you your code gets run, and all of the threading madness happens in a place you don't have to worry about. OK, so here's a complicated example. Um, I define an error domain called compute error that has a bad item and bad data. I define a delegate called compute that takes a double y and returns a double, and it potentially throws a compute error. And then I have this function called map product that returns a double. It takes a predefined G list that contains a double called L. Well, the list is called L. And a delegate compute called C. So if there are no items in my list, I return negative 1. Otherwise, I set P equal to 1.0. The type of P is automatically inferred to be double. I go for each over my G list. Um, each item will be v. I try to do p times um, my compute function times that value. If I catch a compute error, then I go to standard error. I print the value and the string, like the message inside my exception. If the exception is a bad data error, then I return negative 1. Otherwise, I just keep going. At the end, I return my product. So this kind of takes a weird product over some transform of data in a list of doubles. It's pretty readable for C. <laughs> um, OK, so let's do something with classes. Um, I create an abstract class foo. Inside it has a property called name that anyone can read and only children can set. I have a virtual method called quux that returns an int. I have a two-string method that takes a string with um, a, a string and the int inside of it, and I fill those with the name of this this name property and calling quux on myself. Then I create a derived class bar from foo. If bar is called with the default constructor, then um, name equals nameless. I can create another constructor by using a dot to give it a uniquely identifying name if I want to overload constructors. So I have one with name, where string name, and I just set the name to that. I override quux, and I return 8. So if I created one of these quuxes with the default constructor and then called toString on it, I would get name nameless quux 8. If I actually pass the name with my with name constructor, then I get whatever the name was in 8. Reasonably straightforward? OK. So regular classes have memory counts that are automatically managed, and they're destroyed when there are no references left. That leads you to the obvious question, what if I have a cycle? Um, cycles will cause problems, but you can create weak references. A weak reference is not counted. Um, so basically, it knows the object knows how many weak references exist to it, but it, um, it won't matter for garbage collection purposes. So if you imagine I have a tree, I would have one real reference from the parent to the children, and then I might have a weak reference from each child to the parent. So when I lose the parent, the parent then loses its children, and all of the references pointing up just get ignored, and I garbage collect in a reasonably good fashion. There is also a delete statement if you have to do it manually. 
I have written some reasonably complicated Vala code and never had to worry about memory management. It's by and large, it seems to just work. Um, assuming you're working with APIs that are proper if you're dealing with C code. Compact classes, those are ones from existing C code, have exactly one owner. When the owner goes out of scope, the reference is freed. Um, the other parts of the program can have an unowned reference. It works just like a regular reference, but it will never try to free it. It just assumes that it has its pointer until such time as it's told it doesn't. Structs are allocated on the stack. When they go out of scope in the owner, the contents are freed. That includes if they're defined inside a class, wherever they're defined, whenever the owning scope gets rid of it, the contents are taken care of. If you want to explicitly free something or unreference it, simply set it to null. You don't need to call a destructor, just to go, you know, x equals null, and that thing is effectively gone. And because this is done without a garbage collector, it happens at a predetermined time. So you have deterministic control over this. So you can actually write destructors that do something unlike Java and C Sharp when they might run mm -hmm, whenever. Um, so when you have a database collection, you know, it goes out of scope and it's freed and, you know, it makes sense. Um, so here's a little ownership example with some fun ownership stuff. So this function will return a file stream, which is a compact class. Or, sorry, it returns, it might return a, comp, a file stream, it might return null. It takes a file stream that is owned. So the calling code must give control of this um, object to this function. And it has a file stream. If it's a, if it's a return value, it's assumed that you're giving ownership. If you're taking something, it's assumed that it's unowned. You don't specify that manually. So F I will own, G I will not. So I now open a file stream, um, H. If H is, um, if h is not null, so if I actually open the file, if the file foo exists and I can read it, then I will return h. I owned f, so f will be released automatically by Vala. I don't have to write that. It did it for me. Um, I cannot assign g, which I do not own, to z, which I do own, because I'm taking ownership of something that I did not have control over. Similarly, um, I cannot do this with f because it thinks I'm trying to duplicate f. However, I am able to transfer ownership from f to x, basically hot potato it out of f and into x. f will be null after I've done this. I have taken it, I've quite literally taken it out of f and put it into x by transferring ownership with this owned cast. I also like the fact that it's owned because that means owned C++ is a valid piece of Vala code. Um, then I can write to x, and then I can return x. Um, h will be null in this case, so there's nothing to free. I'm returning something I own, so there's no problem. I don't do anything with g, because I never owned it in the first place. So you write pretty straightforward code, and it does more or less what you'd expect to do from a memory management perspective. So what is the relationship between file stream and file? Because I keep talking about them. So this is a snippet of the file stream definition. So it's a public class. Um, inside it, there's a constant end of file. There's a static method open that takes a string and the mode, and it maybe returns a file stream. Um, there's an instant method printf that takes format and then variadic arguments. There's a put c that takes a char and there's a get C that returns an int. OK. Now, how does that map to the underlying C? That's how. These attributes explain exactly how it maps to the underlying C. So first, this is a compact class. That means there's only one copy of it allowed. Um, C code attributes direct what, Vala is going, what kind of C code Vala is going to generate. So the C name is the C name. Um, <laughs> for this. So file stream is really file. How do I free it? Well, there's a free function called foreclose. So whenever a file stream goes out of scope, I should call foreclose on it. Okay, 
Where do I get this from? C header file name tells me the header file that I need to import into the, into the generated C code so that I actually have access to all of this. OK, inside my class, here's my public const int. Well, it's just called EOF, and it lives in stud.io. Fine. OK, what about this open static method? Well, it's just called fopen, and this maps exactly, right? It takes a char star and a char star in C, and it returns a file star. So nothing I have to worry about. OK, let's look at printf. Well, the real name is fprintf. It's printf format, so you can do type checking on the variadic arguments. That's pretty straightforward. Fputsi. Um, OK. Fputsi has char C and then the file star that you're putting C2. Well, Val lets us specify the instance position. So basically, you're telling it what order this is. In the case of fprintf, it's first, which is what Vala assumes, so I don't have to specify anything. But if it comes in some weird position, that's OK. I can just tell it where it belongs. Um, Forget C, straightforward. Again, there's only one thing, so I don't have to worry about instant position. You can also specify a lot of information about the arrays. If you're taking an array, Vala will by default assume that you have the array followed by an int and then the array length. And if you're returning an array, it will assume that you get the pointer to the array here and that the last argument is an int pointer to the, where the array length should go. If that's not how it is, you can specify exactly what you need through a bunch of C codes. Um, similarly, okay, let's look at the time structure in Vala and the underlying struct tm. So Vala looks at it like this. There's a struct called time. It's got two fields, int and second. There's actually a bunch more, but uh, since I figured no one really cares about hours or days. Um, okay, there's a static function called local time that takes a reference to a time t and will um, put out a time structure that does not need to be initialized. And there's a strf time that takes a array of characters and a format string and spits out a size t. So um, the underlying C name is struct tm. You get this from time.h. This just tells it that this isn't part of glib's magic, so be careful. Um, the name, for some retarded reason, C decided to name all of its structures with starting with the structure name, like all the members of structure starting with the structure name. So it's tm, tm, sec. I was like, I don't need to know that. Call it second. That's what it's really called. So you can rename things to be nicer. Um, local time, again, it can figure that out that this time is going to be a pointer. This is also going to be a pointer. Sturf time, again, instance pause equals negative one. It's going to count from the end. You can also specify the order using, these can be floats. So if I wanted it to be in between char s and format, I could say 1.1, and it would put it in between. Or I could have 1.1 and 1.2 if I had a bunch of parameters that had to go in there, and it will order them all nicely for me. So whatever weird C code you're dealing with, you can probably come up with a VAPI um, binding for it, and then get to use it nicely. And all of the memory management will be taken care of if you do this right. So how would you encode this? Stirred up um, takes a char star, returns a char star. Well, that's pretty easy. Both of those char stars are just strings, right? And this string is being returned. It's owned. It's my job to take care of. In contrast, stir error takes an int and it returns a char star, but this char star is owned by the operating system or by the libc. You are not to free those strings. So we can tell it's an unowned string. And rather than just saying int, which we might confuse, we can create an enum called error. We can fill in all of the different enum, uh, all the different values that exist for the error codes that stir error takes. And now we've gained type safety, even if we don't have it in the original C because we can check that I don't just put error zero, basically. Um, so stir tall is the one that parses a, um, a long from a string. So the n pointer is the string that you're going to parse. n pointer is going to be the pointer to the end of the string wherever it stopped being able to parse from. 
and int base is the, you know, whether you want it base 10 or base 16 or whatever. Um, and then it's going to return a, a long int. So in Vala code, we can actually put this inside a long, haha, ha, and make it prettier. Um, so it's going to return a long, it's going to take a string as the input. We're going to get out, we might get out an unknown string. So basically, we're going to take an out parameter, because this is going to be filled with something. It's going to be a string. We don't own this string, because this is the actual real copy of that string. We're just getting a substring inside that string. And by default, this can be null, i.e. Um, Sturtall just won't bother filling this in. And we also have a base, which again, by default, is 10. So now I can basically go long.parse some string, and I'll get back my long. Okay, so back to the for each example. So I have, this is actually the underlying code for the original example. Um, so I've got this for each function that takes a foo star, which we're going to assume is some kind of class. And then it takes a function pointer that returns nothing, takes an int, and takes uh, something. And this also takes uh, something. And every time I call this, I'm just going to pass this uh, something to here. That's the target information that Val is going to use. So those are all of the parameters that um, you want to pass. You can do that using the void star, using this void star. So this is the context information that this function pointer needs. So this is actually a closure. And this is actually a very common C coding convention, if not a really, really ugly one. So what I can do is I can create a delegate called int visit, which is void, just like my function pointer, takes an int, and Vala will automatically assume that I've got a void pointer at the end for all of the context information. Then I can create my class foo, and I can specify the prefix on all of the um, instances. So just by calling this one for each, it will automatically do foo underscore for each. Save some time, depending on how regular your names are. And it takes an int visitor, which Vala will assume is not only this function pointer, but the context information as well. And again, this is a reasonably standard C coding convention. It's just been codified. This little at here, um, like C sharp, Val lets you define any keyword as a variable. So if you want to create a keyword, a variable called if, you can do it. Just put an at sign in front of it, which is really convenient when words like default are taken or out. OK. So what's the problem with Vala? Um, it's buggy. The compiler, uh, getting the compiler to crash is not really a challenge. Um, it doesn't always generate the correct C code. So in the case of a delegate, if I create a delegate called x, some parameter a, and then my dots, it will generate the C code x, then my parameter a, then the dots, then my context pointer. And the C compiler will go, dots have to be last, dude, and die horribly. Um, this this is currently sitting in Bugzilla. I've, there is no current solution. Um, when you're dealing with existing C code, um, you've got if you put if you fail to put an unowned on something that should be unowned, then you potentially double free it. If you put an unowned on something that doesn't need an unowned that does need it, that is owned, then you will leak memory. And the reverse is true for in parameters. So if you're taking an existing C library and trying to smash it into the Vala hole, and you do it wrong, you spend a lot of time sort of fiddling getting the memory management right. But once you have the working um, binding, it's really easy to use that interface. So the VAPI files, these interfaces, these bindings, are very time consuming and tedious to write. But once you have one, they're fantastic. And a lot already exists. Um, when it generates incorrect C code, probably because your binding is wrong, you can spend a fair amount of time beating your head against the wall. Also, you still have C code. You still have all the fun issues of C linking, um, which no one likes C linking. Um, so basically, you have a type type wrapper on C with objects. You get nicer syntax than C++ or Objective-C, uh, in my opinion. Um, you get way easier memory management than C++ or Objective-C. In particular, um, 
you get memory management on existing C, which is something that neither C++ nor Objective-C can offer you. It's still more complicated than Java or C Sharp, which actually have a um, garbage collector. You still have the limits of C, so you're not going to be able to do any method overloading. Um, but it's really easy to interface with existing C and for existing C to interface with Vala. Um, and you get a safety net, a type safety net on existing C code. It is really immature and it's going to evolve. That's more or less how it is. As for bindings, um, just quickly. So these are some of the bindings that are already written and available inside Vala. Um, it's pretty extensive and some things that you know, like the read line library. Um, so if you want to do console IO, you get the read line library. It's been sort of sanitized into objects and um, object oriented approaches to many of the problems that you would have. Um, you also get um, namespace control to some degree. The Vala compiler, we, you sort of feed it this directory with all of these API references and you can specify which ones you'd like to compile. If you're using package config, which is a fairly standard um, library linking tool for C that the GNOME people have enforced as their standard, then it will actually get the C compiler to have all the correct flags for you. So you just go, you know, if you go package um, one of the like GIO or Pango or um, almost any of the ones that start with a G, it will take care of all the linker settings and and compiler settings for you. If it's one of the other ones, then you may have to additionally specify, okay, you know, L this and um, I that to get your includes and linking right in C. So, any questions? Other than, what the hell am I smoking? <laughs> there are, um, they're pretty immature. Um, they don't have good completion. And that's, good completion is the only thing I want in an IDE. So if there isn't good completion, I'm not interested. <laughs> I've been doing it all in um, VI, and VI's completion actually does a pretty good job. Um, so I haven't had too many complaints in terms of doing it without an IDE. Um, your mileage may vary. Yep. Yeah. Um, outside of, okay, so glib is actually pretty extensive. Um, so glib has a bunch of things that are particularly useful. In addition, it has this main loop idea. So if you have some kind of, I want to block on IO, you know, you, you know, the sort of big, C select loop of I've got data coming from different sources and then notify me when something actually comes in. Glib does that. Um, right. G is your standard data structures world. So you get array list, hash map, hash multi map, hash multi set, hash set, linked list. Priority queue, tree map, tree multi map, tree multi set, tree set. Um, there's a hash table inside glib2, and there's a string builder inside glib. That covers most of what I end up doing. I don't know. Yes, it's all this. All of G is is generic compatible. Yep. So if I pull up one. Um, yeah, array list and then your overridable or your type parameter. And um, in particular, I find STL's iterators are awful. Um, uh, for something like the, let me show you the hash map. So hash map, you can't actually iterate over a hash map, but hash map has a bunch of, because um, it doesn't 
doesn't mean anything to iterate over a hash map. Um, but it has a keys, values, and entries category. So you can basically go for each um, var x in map.keys, and you'll iterate over all the keys, or dot entries, and you'll get all the key value pairs. Um, so yeah, that's it's pretty straightforward to do that. Um, other things of note in glib, um, you get time and date handling. Um, you get an option parser. So if you've got command line options, you basically say, these are my options. When you, if you find this option, here is the variable I would like you to fill with the option. So you create a bunch of global variables. You basically say, OK, if I get a thing, then put it there. And it can, it can handle um, multi-options. So you can have like um, a string array. And it will fill that string array with um, whatever you get on the command line. You basically say, go. And it generates the help for you. Um, so that's actually really nice. Uh, it does regexes. There, there's an experimental in language regex, so you can just go squiggle and then double like slash regex slash. That's not in the mainstream one yet. Um, it has some odd things that have kind of made themselves into glib. So like all of the glib um, default configuration files are like um, the Windows INI files, like the key value kind of files. So there's a key value file parser in here just because. Um, string builder, um, there's a bunch of mutexes. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of type conversion stuff. So you can convert between different um, character encoding formats. Um, uh, there's some assertion stuff in here. So you can do stuff like assert not reached uh, fairly easily. Um, Access error no, all of what would be in C's math library is here. Um, uh, what else is here? Uh, atomic ints, if you want to do that. Um, if you want to fork off processes, there's some stuff to deal with file names. Um, so if you want to, you know, split things into chunks. Oops. Um, random numbers. And some URI, URL handling stuff. But there are a lot of other um, uh, GNOME related libraries. So it might be in one of them. GNOME tends not to package things in giant globs, it tends to break them up into little pieces. So there's a completely separate, if you just use glib, then you get the regular file IO that I showed you with file stream. If you want fancy file IO, there's a GIO package that lets you do stuff like. Um, access remote servers using URLs and stuff like that all done for you. Um, you can also look at the basic types. Um, so here's int. Um, it has a, you can do min, max, convert endianness, um, parse, to string, limit the value, um, take the absolute value. Uh, there's the max int and min int sort of already nicely defined here. Um, so you don't have to remember what the constant names are them are for them. Um, additionally, if you look at string, um, the string is pretty darn complete. You can do a join. Um, so if you've got you know the the what, what Python or PHP would call an implode kind of operation, um, there's a split which is an explode. Um, you've got the printf, so you can just fill in a string with variables. Um, the Strings are a little strange because it assumes the string is a UTF-8 string, which is compatible with a C string. So if you want to do, in, in Java and C Sharp, it assumes that every character is a Unicode character. Here it's not. It's assumed that every character is a char. But there is a unichar. And if you want to deal with strings in a Unicode-ish way, you can. And everything's set up that if you're not very smart about it, you'll still get reasonable Unicode support um, out of it. Anything else? I'm going to stop recording.